scripture. Uh, some today will call this message unloving or cruel. Some say this message is a message of encouragement. I am on that side. But a lot of us, most of all, us, majority of humans on this planet does not like to hear true facts about death. It is amazing sometimes even believers are still fearful of death and the Lord has provided all kinds of promises in Scripture for us. Most individuals in life, they try to avoid or talking about death. Got a good friend of mine, uh, Lori knows him, and he's a good friend of mine, and I'll talk to him, and I'll say, well, you know, when, when death comes, he'll go, he'll go a different direction. Don't want to talk about it. Don't bother me about that, literally. Uh, and many are like that. They, they don't want to talk about that appointment that is going to come. Uh, yet, they don't want to think about it. They don't want to talk about it. Why? Because they want to somehow in their heart and mind, forget that that appointment date is set. And regardless of how you try to steer around it, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. That means 100% is going to happen to each and every one of us. Uh, I pray that the Lord will return and, and we avoid all of that. But if he does not, uh, it will take place to each and every one of us. Um, some will have a testimony in heaven. You know, when, when John, the Apostle John, that wrote the gospel, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John in Revelation, in the book of Revelation, when John is talking about being on the island of Patmos, and, and we always may be curious of why he was put out there, uh, Demetrius and all of these things, and, but he tells us, he <coughs> says, because of the testimony and the word of God. And sometimes, I mean, what a blessing. Sometimes we have, mankind has, a testimony in heaven. Who are these? Well, those that believe in Jesus. But there's also those that will be in hell and will have a testimony. That's true. We'll see one today. Um... Do you know, and I've thought about this long and hard, do you know if I had to take a walk through the, the hell's corridor and I had to, to see different individuals in walks of life, maybe I knew them, maybe I didn't, the worst individual that I could meet is the individual that is shocked that they're there. They're surprised that they're there. And that individual, I believe, when hell is enlarged, the Bible says, some will die today in this county, in this state, around the world, and they will meet this man in Scripture. There's those in hell that has a testimony because they're so surprised that they're there. And I believe if we could take a walk, and I don't want to, but if we could take a walk through there, there's going to be those that said, yeah, I was evil. Yeah, I did this. Yeah, I did that. Yes, I did this. And yes, God was right. I knew, I, I, but there's going to be those that's going to be good people. And I know the Bible says none is good, but we get this in our mind that we're good people. And there's going to be people there that is so shocked that they're there. And that's the people I think is going to have the strongest testimony. Now let me Keep in mind, or let me put in your mind just for a moment. Some of these that are surprised and shocked they're there is even those that attended church. 
Can I get an amen? Amen. Mm -hmm. They said, but I was a member there. I was baptized there. I was faithful to that local church. I even painted the walls and did the plants and helped the secretary and called and checked on those for their health and well-being. I was always early. I gave more than most in that church, Lord, in tithes and offerings. How did I end up here? Because simply they didn't believe in Jesus. Some more that's going to be shocked there is those that are following these religions that are cultic, that has all kinds of merit and work systems. And if you're baptized in the water, you're saved and so forth. And they are led to believe a lie. If you keep pushing on, you keep working towards, you're doing better and God's going to take you home. That's never in the scriptures. Never, ever, ever. That's called self-righteousness. That's called a Pharisee attitude. These people that are shocked that's going to be there is going to have, I believe, the worst and most compelling testimony. <laughs> My dad was a preacher. My brother-in-law was a missionary. Well, Lord, we have served on the mission field for some 40 years. And, Lord, how did I end up here? You see, it's not just all the evil. God says, if you believe in me, you shall have eternal life. That's a period, not a question mark. And then there's going to be those that worked hard in the ministry in their local church, maybe at food banks, Maybe at giving, at charities. God, how did I end up here? God, I worked my fingers to the bone. Lord, I, I was at the church door or wherever it was. Every single service. And Jesus has gave us an answer in the Gospels. Do you remember what he said? Depart from me. Workers of iniquity, for I never want knew you. knew you. It's a relationship. It's relationship. And I pray today that you have that relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, believeth on him that sent me, has everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death into life. Truly, truly, I say unto you, the hour is coming. Every one of us, I don't care who you are, your background, your family, your age. Someone's going to say, well, I can live to be probably 97 to 102 years old. You really think so? Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. The hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they here shall live. Listen, we may physically die, but to be physically die or dead is going to happen to all of us. But it doesn't mean that all of us in the world has the same destiny. Folks, this is chilling. Folks, this is, this is nail curling or spine tingling, whatever you want to say. This is unnerving. This, this is, when we go over this passage this morning. But Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And if you keep my commandments, that does not mean sinless. That means that you're living and making Lord of your life. 
If you live for Jesus Christ, he said, I will no longer call you slaves, but friends. Now, what will a good friend do? When you may be messing up, you may think this or desire that, but what is a good friend going to do? Lie to you and pacify you? And say, oh, yeah. Yeah, look, you know, yeah, this is great. Oh, you're doing, oh, yeah, you're on the top of the list. You're something else. And then they go home and say, well, I can't believe that person. Anybody ever do that before? All right, the rest of you is forgiven, amen? But when you have a good friend, a real friend, they're going to tell you the truth even if it hurts you, amen? And I might be mad at that true friend. But I will long respect that true friend than the one that did not have the courage and the respect to tell me the truth. Amen? This is our friend Jesus. And this is what he's saying here this morning. Let's get into the passage. First of all, no human soul that God ever created will cease to exist. Annihilationism is taught. What does that mean? Somehow you just go out into the atmosphere and I guess you're like a, a soap bubble out of a little can that children have. You pop the bubble, poof, you're gone. No, no. No, no. There will not be a soul that God created. I'm talking about mankind. There will not be a soul that will cease to exist ever. We will exist somewhere. We will live somewhere. Forever. Now, the question is, before we go into this, is where is your place of destiny that you have chosen? You say, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I can't choose my destiny. That's what God, no. God gave you everything you needed. He gave you the blood, the blood sacrificial atonement on the cross of Jesus and it forgives every sin you have ever committed. And if you repent, a change of mind, believe, choose to trust in Jesus as your Savior, that sin is forgiven. You say, well, it's that simple. Yes. Yes. So when someone says, well, you know, you can't choose your destiny. We're going to float out there somewhere. God will put us here. That's not biblical. That's not a biblical concept. Now, you know something amazing, and a lot of, a lot of people says this, Bible students, scholars and things, they say, well, you know, you know that parable in Luke chapter 16, well, hang on just a minute, and, and I'll give you this one for free. Amen? There's a lot of parables in, in the Synoptic Gospels. That's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There's a lot of parables. Parables about money, Parables about lordship, parables about many things, farmers, seeds, all kinds of things that Jesus used. In none of those parables did he use a personal name. Now, am I saying this is not a parable? No. But I'm telling you, if this is a parable, if this is a story, a biblical account, I'm sure of that. But whatever you may call this, Jesus is bringing this down home because he mentions the name Lazarus. This is personal. So it's not just a simple parable. Um, but anyway, look at verse 19. You're going to see three different things. You're going to see life. You're going to see death. And then you're going to see destiny. Two different lives of men. And we know this. Look at verse 19. We've, we've seen this. So here's this rich man. Oh, he's clothed in purple and fine linen. And fared sumptuously every day. You say, well, I don't think that that was very fine linen. And I don't think that because you've never seen me wear a purple suit. Amen. Back in that day, if you wore purple, to make it just a real quick point here, you had to be in the sea, as the sea would wash, wash up the, the, the shellfish, or you had to dive for the shellfish, you had to extract the dye from the shellfish, numerous, numerous hours of collecting thousands upon thousands of shellfish, 
and then besides that, you would have to extract the dye. In order for you to wear purple every day, your wardrobe was, was purple. And look at the fine linen. That means his undergarment. This man was living just as the scripture said. Oh, he's living fine. Oh, he's living real well. Now, who is Jesus speaking to in this biblical account? Well, namely the Pharisees. But Jesus also has a broader picture than that. He's speaking to you today. He's speaking to me today. He's speaking to the readers. He's speaking to the disciples. He's speaking to the Jewish there, or if there were Gentiles that came in. But he's talking to the Pharisees because the Pharisees believe this. And somehow we got this concept in our mind today. That if someone has a big, beautiful home, nothing wrong with that. That's not sin. No. God never does, does say that riches are sinful. It's what you do with the riches that are sinful. Amen? So this, we have a big, beautiful home and luxury vehicles and maybe you're wearing purple out of your closet every day. Amen? They say, well, you know what? That individual, the Pharisees says, that individual is so blessed by God. Look at all that they've accumulated. Listen, let's listen. When you read the Bible, the blessings of God, 95% of the time is not material, they're spiritual blessings. Amen? Amen? So because he's going to bless you with what you need to be able to perform how he wants you to perform, we call that obedience, in reaching the lost, in teaching the saints, edifying the church, on the mission field, whatever it may be. He's going to bless you. And so the Pharisees said, well, the bigger the house, the longer the driveway, the more expensive SUV. Boy, God bless that family. And somehow that's in our mind today. Now, God can bless that way. But here, this rich man, you're going to see, is not a believer. You know, when we think of someone that is rich, now once again, rich, 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 money, gain, monetary, is not sin. It's how you choose to operate with what you have can be sin. For the love of money is the root of what? All evil. Those kinds of things. So we're talking about this rich man and you know, a lot of times we see those that are just filthy rich that we talk about like that, and we say, wow, they are at such an advantage. They have got so much resources at their fingertips, I bet they don't even have to worry about life. Wait a minute, stop. Many, 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 many people that we see, the rich and famous, they are at a huge disadvantage in life. Why? Because most often, not all times, but most often, their riches puts them in a position where they don't have to depend upon God. That's a disadvantage. Amen? Their riches become the security. It becomes their security blanket. So they have a disadvantage. Is it a sin to be rich? No, no, and no. This man that we're going to read about here in a minute, Abraham was rich. Joseph of Arimathea, he is the one that got the tomb for Jesus. He was rich. Nicodemus, John chapter 3, was rich. It's not the richest part. But it is the people behind the riches that are at the disadvantage. Not all. So anyway, let's get started here. Certain rich man, clothed with purple and fine linen. Oh, he fared sumptuously every day. That means he just lived life to its fullest every day. 
every day. Now, we're talking about the first subject is life. Now, in verse 20, you're going to see the contrast. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. This is not the Lazarus that Jesus rose from the grave. This is a different Lazarus. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which laid at his gate. Whose gate? The rich man's gate. No doubt. Just like today. Now, I know you have those that fool you. I know you have those that work the streets, uh, that are conniving. But when Jesus said this man is a beggar, he's a beggar. And he's laying at this rich man's gate. And no doubt this rich man had servants. And when this rich man would go in and out of his driveway, the poor man said, Man, I just wish he would throw me a few scraps from his banquet table. And no doubt from what we read here, the rich man is going through his driveway, and this man is, is, a, is something that he wished would disappear. He wished this poor man would go away. This poor man's a nuisance. He's always there at my gate. No doubt that he had that attitude, and we'll read further, and we'll see. Well, so here we got a rich man and a beggar. Look at verse 21. Desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Why would he put that in there? Because poor people are hungry. Well, yes. But there's more to the story. Well, here we come. Here's these old dogs. Couldn't you imagine? Someone, you, someone in your family is sick, full of sores, and there's some mangy mutts that's licking the sores on their body. Can you get much lower? Can you imagine that? It reminds me of the priest and the, the servant of the temple in, those, in the parable that Jesus talked about when this man was robbed and beaten. And the preacher said, don't want nothing to do with that. So he crossed the street and went by. So here comes one that serves the temple of God. And he says, ooh, not my business. And that man just was laying there dying. And then some Samaritan had come, bandaged him up, put him on a horse, put him in a motel for the night. Jesus said, that is the man there. Wonder how many times Believers go by and say, well, you know what? He has every opportunity, like everyone else, to work, to make money. He has every opportunity. He don't have to lay there and be like this. He can get up. He can do something. Well, probably when he was younger in life, he's messed his life up. And Why would we think and say all of those things? Why would we not say, do you need a hand? Do you need help? What is wrong? Hmm. So we don't want to be like the rich man, right? Well, let's look at verse 22. Uh-oh. Here is something. We talked about their life. We see a snapshot of their life. Jesus gives us. And now he gives a snapshot of their death. It came to pass that the beggar died. Well, you, you can imagine that, right? I mean, he's laying down there. He's physically diseased. He's full of sores. Uh, the mangy butts in the neighborhood is licking on his sore. Well, you know, and someone's going to say, well, you know, it was only a matter of time. Look at his health. I've said that before. Not that mangy mutts that are licking sores on someone. But I say, well, you know, their health is failing. It's part of life. They've been in the hospital. You know, it may be time. Well, sometimes we can see that. Sometimes God really surprises us and they live on for years. But sometimes we can say, well, you know, because of their condition. Well, now, wait a minute. That's the beggar's death. 
Now, watch this. Now, I know that some said, well, you know what? When my grandma, when my mama, when my daddy, brother, sister, cousin, when my best friend, when they died, you know, and, and I knew this deacon that I served with for many, many years and, and loved this deacon, and, and he was so uh, fun and, and so silly acting, and, and we had done a lot of things together in the church. And, and he said that when his mama died, he said it was as if the, the hospital room, as if the, the ceiling opened up, and he saw angels coming and, and just taking his mama home. Well, they did. You see, when the beggar died, he's different than the rich man. It's not the material gain or the material loss. It's not poor and rich here. The beggar died and was carried by angels. Angels. To Abraham's bosom, to Abraham's chest. Wait a minute. This guy that's living sumptuously every day, dressed in the best garments in life, has the best of everything, has all the toys in life, every whistle and bell he, he owns, and, and everything is awesome. He left that big old mansion that even had a gated driveway for someone else because he died. You know, it is odd I knew a preacher one time. I knew of him. I didn't know him personally, but I knew of him, and I knew some of the people in the church. This pastor was a fine man. And he said, uh, you know, he, I talked with him. He said, we know I'm concerned with this lady in the church. Um, she has not been doing well at all. And this lady, I believe maybe the Lord's going to take her home. And he talked with me about that, and he says, you know, I've prayed with her and I've talked with her, you know, and oh, I just really, really hate to see the Lord take this woman home. And he was for sure that this woman was going to go home and be with the Lord. And he said, well, brother, I'm going to get off here. He says, I'm going to rest a little bit before Sunday night service. I said, all right, brother. Well, call me. Let me know how I will. I never got that phone call. He died in his sleep. The woman lived about another 15 years. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know when this is going to come. We could assume this poor old beggar because of his physical condition, but who would have thought the rich man, right? Now I want you to show I want to show you something here in the passage. Well, we see here the beggar died. He's carried to by the angels, that is his spirit, his soul, to Abraham's bosom. Why Abraham? Because he was the father of the Jews. And Jesus is using this because he's talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to the Jews here. And here's Father Abraham. And guess what? This is the highest pinnacle that anyone could ever get because the angels takes him to Father Abraham and he's on the way to glory. Well, awesome. But, the rich man also died, and he was buried. Now, now look, you say, okay, he was buried. Well, these boys were buried. No, that's not what the scripture says. The rich man was buried. Now, can you imagine the, the rich and the famous? You, you see it on TV, and wealth and position and society. If there's someone high in society, oh, they, they, they're a rocket scientist, or they've won the Nobel Peace Prize, or they've been president or something, they're just really in the high line or Hollywood figures in the movies. Oh my. Thousands upon thousands could show up at a funeral and pay tribute to him or her and there's those that are so rich and famous that they have the best burials, the best speakers, all the best of the best of the best that money could afford. Do you know that this rich man, before his burial, his funeral, all of this was taking place? Do you know he was already in hell screaming? Well, let's go back to the, to the poor man. Well, he was buried, wasn't he? No. 
You see, those that are insignificant in, in Jewish society in these areas, in this topographical areas here, they, they were insignificant. They were poor. They were diseased. Well, they were expected to die. And, and when someone was not rich and famous and someone was not well known and, and he, they were someone in society, in the law, maybe they was a part of the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, if they're not, then, then these people that are just worthless, now I'm saying that according to Scripture. I don't think anyone's worthless. But according to this he was just worthless. They would carry, they would roll the, the body up in some type of fabric. They would roll the body up. They would carry the body out town or outside of town and they would throw it in the trash pile. Whether he, the body would be burned or eaten by animals or whatever. <laughs> wow. You say, how cruel. I agree. But watch. There's more to the story. So we see here, oh, in verse 23, oh, this man, this rich man, uh, he's, he's lifting up his eyes. What is he doing? He's lifting up his eyes. Can I tell you something about the rich man? He's lifting up his eyes. You said you said that already. No, I said he lifted up his eyes. What do you mean? Oh, he could feel. He could remember. He could taste. He could see. Oh, yeah. Do you see? Well, we'll come down on this little old hell place here. We'll probably be put in some catacomb, stored away. We'll be nothing but a blob. Oh, no, 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 no. He lifted up his eyes. And he said, Father Abraham, Abraham. He had insight. He had a memory. He had feel, touch. Hearing, he carried a conversation. And he begins to say this. He says in hell, he lift up his eyes. Oh, he's in torments. And if you'll read this, you'll see torments, torments, torments in the passage. And, and he sees Abraham afar off. And, and guess who's with Abraham? That old sick man that, that aggravated him and irritated him and where all the dogs would gather at at the gate, maybe the dogs messed up in his driveway, and he was irritated when he would go in and out, and the old man was there. Well, guess what? The poor old beggar is on his way to glory. And then he says this. Oh, Father Abraham. Oh, Father. See, now it's time to get righteous, but it's too late. Oh, Father Abraham. Father Abraham, what is he saying Father Abraham for? Because Abraham was, was the patriarch, the father of the Jews. And, and he's saying, oh, Father Abraham, do you know what he's saying? All the Pharisees are looking in on this story while Jesus is telling this story. And some people are have this Pharisee attitude today. My mom and daddy, my grandmama was a Christian, you know what? And because of their religion, because of their belief, I know I'm going to heaven too. Never read that in the passage. Father Abraham, look, I'm a Jew. I'm a, I'm a descendant from you, Father Abraham. I'm, I'm a descendant. I'm a Jew. I, I'm already, I'm chosen. I'm already going in. No. No, that doesn't work either. It's not your family. It's not your status in, the, in this time. Oh, have mercy on me. Now, 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 look, 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 look. Uh, if, if you would, Father Abraham, if you would, uh, could you still send Lazarus? Even in hell, this man still saw this poor man at a disadvantage and as a simple servant. Send, Father Abraham, I don't want to bother you, Abraham, but could you send that man that you have, that you're holding on to right there, could you send that man over and, and, and just... Dip his finger in the water and give him it on my turn. Oh, I'm in great agony here. Now, what did I tell you earlier about the rich man's table? I told you to remember that, right? Now, what is happening when the poor man, why does it say that he's in Abraham's bosom? You say, that's kind of an odd. Well, not to the Jews. It would be, make perfect sense. And I imagine by this time, 
uh, the assassinations here of the Jewish Pharisees and the, the Jewish sect is about ready to find something to stone Jesus right here and now. But this poor man is laying upon Abraham's chest. In these biblical times, now I like this idea, but in these biblical times, when you came to the table, the banquet table, you didn't sit in a chair. And I know mama said, keep them elbows off that table, amen. No, it wasn't like that then. You reclined. And if you was in the seat that sat next to the host, you was in the best position at the table, at the banquet table. A real table, physical table. So here is Lazarus, and he's laying in Abraham's bosom because that was the term for of how they would lay and eat at the dinner table. So you could say, oh, and I'm putting this in here kind of uh, as a smart aleck comment, but it's true. Oh, how the tables have This poor man is sitting at the Lord's banquet table. He's reclining at the table, no more desiring scraps. No, no. He's got the best banquet table there could be. Oh, but wait a minute. Here's the rich man. All of that stuff is gone. And he's in, well, he just wants a drop of water. And you hear people say, well, there's no flames in hell. There's no devil. All them people in the church. That's fine. If you want to believe that, but that's not what Jesus says. And I've heard songs and people make hell a joke. And they say, oh, I'll tell you what, boy. I'm going to hell. I'll tell you what. All my friends will be down there. Boy, I'll tell you what. We'll just have a big old drunken bash. Well, I don't know how they're going to support beer in hell because this man can't even get a drop of water. <laughs> and then we begin to see, we've seen the life. We've seen the death. Look at verse 25. Abraham said, son, you, see, you received the greatest things in, in life. Lazarus received the most evil things, but now he is comforted and you're tormented. And he said, but you know, I know what you're desiring. He said, but you know, there's a great golf fish. What he says is this. He says, you can't come from here and go there, and neither can you come from there and go hence. There's a great golf fix. You see, this is the destiny of the two men. One is in Abraham's bosom, which is a picture of heaven, and then the other is in hell. There's the two destinies. So you have two lives, two deaths, two different destinies. All of them are different. All of them are in contrast. So as we see this here, when you are in hell, you are finished. You cannot say, the most righteous prayer and get removed from heaven or from hell. He says, you, you can't get out. You can't. And he's trying, Abraham is trying to be soft with him as he used, as we've said earlier, son, child, you cannot There is no soul sleep. There is no world up in the sky that you go to and take a Bible class and God will accept you and give you a second chance. No, no, no. You don't get a second go around. Where you're at here in the here and the now, this is where you make the decision. Your decision today determines your destiny in the future. 
And as we begin to close here, verse 27 and 28. Then he said, now watch, I pray. Oh, you're praying now. I pray. Uh, Father Abraham, Father, wait a minute. Father, Father, I pray. Really? He has a legit concern. He does. And we need to grasp it before we go today. Listen. Verse 27, he said, I pray therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. Okay. For I have five brothers that they, that he may testify unto them, that he may tell them my testimony from hell. He says this. You don't want to come to this place of torment. I need someone to go and tell my family. For Lord's sakes, we say, my grandma used to say, don't put yourself in a position to bust hell wide open. Don't do it. And then we see here, Oh, we, we need to tell our loved ones. Now, now listen. Now watch. How, let's apply this to us today. Are you? Are you going to wait too late to tell your loved ones? About the literal hell? Someone says, well, let me tell you something. And I've, I've had this right in my face, literally. There ain't no hell. And I ain't worried about hell. And devil ain't got nothing on me. And I've had them right here. I said, okay. And I said, well, can I ask you a question? And they said, go ahead. You know, they're upset now, you know. And I said, well, if you don't believe in a literal hell, you've made your point. Then I must not be able to believe in a literal cross. The ones that we talked about in the beginning are the ones that, that are surprised. And Lord, forgive me and Lord, forgive you if we say, if one ends up in this place of torment like this man did, and there's people that's going up to glory and saying, yeah, but I plan to tell them. I wanted to tell them the time wasn't right, the smell wasn't right, the car wasn't right, the timing was off. Are we going to wait too late? This man waited too late. He's in hell screaming that someone would go and witness to his family. And he said, verse 30 and 31, he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one went, no, wait, excuse me, go to verse 29. Abraham says unto him, They got Moses and the prophets. Well, they got the whole Old Testament. Now, see, we're still under the Old Testament. They've got the prophets. What is he saying? Well, they've got preachers all over the world here today. They've got people that can, you know, <clears throat> that all they got to do is listen and they can hear. And, and the preacher, the pastor, whatever is going to tell them the truth. But they, they're all over the land. That's what we would say today. All over Facebook, all over media, right? Websites all over the place. He says, Abraham says, all they got to do is hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham. But if one went, now watch this. If one went unto them from the dead. What? I don't know if this guy is saying, well, if you let me sneak out of here for just a minute. I don't know. But he's saying this. If one went from the dead, they'll repent. They'll believe. They'll believe. You remember when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead? Not all believe. You remember that? And he said unto them, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, if they don't want to listen to the, the preachers today, they won't be persuaded, even though one rose from the dead. There's many signs, miracles, and wonders, and we're getting that in John's gospel. And by the way, I do invite you to our Wednesday night Bible study. We are on the ground floor. We're getting into the gospel of John. It is amazing. And John deals with believing in signs and wonders and miracles. But here it is saying, Abraham is saying, you know what? 
you could raise someone from the dead. And they could come out of, a, of the dead and go and tell them. And that doesn't mean that they're going to believe in Jesus. You see, because it doesn't work that way. God must call the sinner. And he will. When God calls the sinner, the one that is lost, and we answer God's calling, and we say, Lord, I am nothing without you. That's all the rich man had to do was believe the word of God. That's all he had to do. And he repeated it. That old beggar, that old hopeless man is now at the banquet table in heaven because he listened and he believed. We saw our life here, life, and we saw death, and then now we also saw destiny, all in different ways, all in contrast. So I ask you here today, don't you go out that door and brush this sermon off and say, well, it was a pretty good sermon. He was right on time. He went through this script. I'm not concerned with that. I am concerned that you, 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 and you will not be where this man is ever. And here is the point I'm trying to make. You don't have to be. All you have to do is believe. You say, but uh, you know what? If I believed in my seat, you know, if I came down this altar and got people would see me in the church, what would they think about me? Oh, if I, if I acted out in the church, if I screamed and I shouted and I praised God, people's going to judge me. Shh, we're in church. I would better be a total, total, if it would take place, a bumbling idiot in God's house, causing all kinds of confusion, not in a bad way, in a good way, than have a testimony from hell. Amen? As we stand.